Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Macaw Podcast Universe. It is your podcast where um, there are two people, namely me, Micah Macaw, and you, Jordan Macaw. And we met when we were in kindergarten or pre kindergarten, and we all. No. <laughs> Wrong. What? I think you were an afternoon kid, and yeah. I was a morning kid. For pre-K and kindergarten. Kindergarten, I was morning as well. Okay. But Who'd Mrs. you have Reed's. for kindergarten? Mrs. Oh. Reed, yeah. I had Mrs. Franson. Okay. <laughs> no, Flinner. For for all you people who... I don't remember. ...don't live in Medford and didn't grow up at Grace Christian, you don't know what we're talking about. But all that to say, uh, we met, you know, a long time ago, and we went to school together and we... Our friendship started on movies and our marriage continues to be fueled by movies. This yes. is Macaw Podcast <laughs> Universe. But see, I'm hitting this for a specific reason, Jordan. At first, I was just doing it for fun. But this whole movie is about when you were younger that we're covering today. Yeah. At World's End. The World... Oh, dang it. The, the World's, World's End. End. So we... Yes. Um, I was I was being silly, but we're married, and we've been married for close to three years now, and uh, we love movies, and we love to talk about movies, and right now, we are the premier... The only podcast with the tagline, we exist to prove people wrong when they say that sequels are better than the originals. We Never have that. Never better. Never better than never. It. Uh, should we start over? No. Okay. Uh, we exist to prove people wrong when they say that sequels are never better than the originals, and we are the premier podcast that does that. We are the absolute best podcast with that in line. And today we are at my parents' lovely home again, and if you want to be kind of a sound techie nerd, you could sit down and listen to the Battle of the Five Armies episode and compare and go. This is so boring. Uh, <laughs> So today we're talking about world, The World's End, which wraps up the Cornetto trilogy. Yes. So what is your history with this movie? So I watched it with you at your parents' house um, in anticipation for Baby Driver. And my f- initial impression of the movie was, I was like, of course it's good, but I didn't like love it by any means. Okay. Um, I think I had, my expectation was that it was going to be a lot funnier than it turns out to be. Yeah. Because, like, Shaun of the Dead is, like, Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz and Scott Pilgrim are, like, laugh out loud funny. And this movie has a few of those moments, but um, it's not quite, it it is definitely a comedy, but it has a lot of drama in it Mm -hmm. as well. And I was not really prepared for that. So I was kind of a little bit like, yeah, I, that's the one that's like not as good as the other ones, is what I thought initially. Yeah. I saw this. I think this was... So when Blockbuster was still a thing, mm-hmm. you know, we'd go like pretty much every weekend. Yeah. What's the movie for Friday night? Oh, yeah. The good old And days. I feel like there's a random batch of movies that my mom probably rented just because she thought it looked good. Yeah. Like, it was like, oh, I think that we'll like it, like all of us, because this came out in, like, 2011. Yeah. So, Veronica and I are in high school, Preston's in middle school. So, it's like, we're not kids. Uh, Because a lot of what we've talked about in this series is like, oh, I never watched that movie until later because it just looked raunchy. Like, it just looked bad and I wasn't allowed to watch it. Which, I'm, as I get older and finally watch these movies, uh, I'm realizing that most of them have never been that met that expectation no yeah i Um, i I think i think uh you know growing up in christian homes and i'm not knocking that but um there there sometimes is an expectation of like oh something is like can be misconstrued as this is a bad thing and then later in life you watch it and you're like not no it's not this is not as bad as dirty harry that you showed me when i was 15 you know yo yeah i remember being really nervous about watching mean girls and I think my mom was even there when I watched it because she was uh-huh. like, it's, I, she probably had already seen it. Like, it's funny. They're, it's fine. Yeah. And I think I remember going into it being like, oh, this is going to be so uncomfortable. <laughs> and it's just a really funny movie. Yeah. Um, I still have yet to see Mean Girls. I know. It's so lame. It's just, it's so funny. Um, I haven't seen it in so long ago, though. But I would say the only movie that I've seen in what we're talking, in the realm of what we're talking about, that actually lived up to the raunchy expectations is super bad. Uh-huh. I remember watching it. I think it was like my mom, Veronica, and me, maybe even Preston. Uh, it was just like, oh, let's just find, I think Veronica had seen it. Uh-huh. And it's like, 
guys, let's just watch this movie finally. Like, we're all adults. Let's okay, just yeah. do it. And we we watched it. And I remember it being funny, but I do remember it being like, oh, um, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, yeah. That's Super about bad. what I thought <laughs> what it was. And I've only seen it once and it was so long ago at this point. I think a uh, 40-year-old virgin was one where I was like, that must be really, really bad. And then when I saw it, I felt like it was really, really bad. But I liked it. I didn't I thought see it was that really movie funny. until recently. Yeah, and then when you and I rewatched it, I was like, it, I mean... I mean, you know, everybody has their different limits on yeah. stuff, but I mean, I if you're an adult, it's like, I don't know. I it's a very funny movie. Yeah, I so with this movie, it, it was like my I think my mom. It was just kind of like random. This movie just came out on DVD. Let's just watch it. Yeah, and I remember we all liked it. I do remember the first time seeing it that the ending was really confusing to me. <laughs> yeah, this might actually be my first Edgar Wright movie. Okay. That would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I thought you saw Scott Pilgrim before this, though. It's possible. I don't know. Listen to the last episode. And I'm pretty sure you I did, because I think you saw Scott Pilgrim, like, in high school, right? Probably. And, and I mean, you still would have seen this in high school, but it would have been, like, senior year, probably. Yeah. So. But I think that when I saw Scott Pilgrim, it was before I was paying attention to directors. Right. It was still, like, who's in the movie. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I remember being pretty confused by the ending, and then I watched it again with you, last night or when we watched it just this time third yeah. time and i now i'm like it's a very hitchhikers ending yeah, to me totally totally um i i don't want to spoil where our rankings of the movies are but did, did it go up or down uh not in rankings but like like how did this compare to the previous times that you've watched this movie i know you kind of said that but like la- the other this night is we like the it. most sad i felt watching it yeah in comparison to the other times yeah it's pretty sad it is it, it is yeah it ends on a hopeful note though oh yeah i think for me it uh it went up like a lot this yeah. viewing like i was like oh man i really really like this movie a lot yeah and i did not give it enough credit when i saw it the first time this this is just this these three movies i could watch anytime it doesn't matter yeah. I, I don't get tired watching these movies. They're all so good. Yeah. And I, it, it's funny because like we said, we tried doing Winnie the Pooh just didn't work. Yeah. And the, the biggest reason why we wanted to do Winnie the Pooh, cause it was a, a nice change of pace from what we've done. Yeah. And it's something a little bit more relaxing. And what's funny is, you know, we do a pivot to this series and I feel like this is what I wanted Winnie the Pooh to do. And yeah, it's it's kind of I think not that Winnie the Pooh's bad people. No, That's no, no. Not it, why. The, the thing we found is that the Winnie the Pooh was like, like they're fun movies. They're nice, and um, I I really really like Christopher Robin and the first one a lot. But um, it, it, it's just like there there wasn't a lot of meat for us to talk to beyond like oh this is charming, and then like next scene and we're like oh that's charming too. Yeah. Oh, I like this part. Oh, this part was very kid friendly, you, you know. Yeah. So there's a lot more meat in these movies to discuss over an hour, you know. Yeah. Um, but they're still hilarious. They give you a nice endorphin rush. Yeah. Because of that, like, I mean, in, in in these times when it's like, just watch a comedy. Yeah. Don't. Oh yeah, but what I was gonna say is, I think Edgar Wright for us, um, in a lot of ways, is a, like, kind of like a comfort director. Yes. Even though he's. It's not like, uh, you know, how some people might throw on, like, Jersey Shore or something for comfort. Yeah. It's, like, good. Yeah, They're yeah, good yeah. movies, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's also very comforting to watch. Yeah. And I think since, because I, I think we, yeah, we wouldn't have been married yet because Baby Driver came out in 2017. We watched all these movies together. So, like, all, all the directors that you and I have watched all their movies together are, like, extra special to me, you know? Stanley Kubrick among them. Yeah, Stanley Kubrick, kind of yeah. Yeah, I, that was before we were dating, and we were. It's like, hey, come over and let's watch three the three let's hour watch Spartacus. Spartacus. And Veronica, I guess you're just here too. Yeah, fall asleep on the couch because <laughs> yeah. we didn't ask you if you wanted to watch this movie. Nope, like a couple of idiots. <laughs> also, very funny to not be dating someone and watching Eyes Wide Shut at your parents' house late late <laughs> at night with uh, this girl that you're that's your friend, very close friend. And I think you kind of felt the same way where it's like, oh, this is very, this is kind of awkward, but we are going to oh, watch. We went into that knowing we were going to fast forward through that movie. It is true. So. I remember yeah. a total, total side note, and I'm going to put this in the note so I remember. Um, 
that we we like talked to your dad because we were like we gotta watch all the Stanley Kubrick movies. We just have to. And we talked to your dad and we we had him like break down a Clockwork Orange and if he thought yeah. it would be okay because it's always been. Whenever I looked at movies, it's like, oh, this is an X-rated yep. movie. Like, it's it was is that one, that bad, one? bad, bad. Was that like NC-17 or whatever? But that probably wasn't even a rating yet. But Yeah, it was X. It was X. It was rated yeah. X, yeah. And uh, then then when w- w- I watched it, um, that was before we watched it together. It was, yeah. Um, and I remember watching that movie, and I was like, okay, yes, it's very, very graphic. And there are a lot of people that probably shouldn't watch it. But if that's what you get out of this movie, you don't get the movie. Yeah. There are so many movies like that, I and feel like... And it's okay like, not to get that movie. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, a lot of people can't handle it, and that's probably amazing. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> yeah. In some ways, yeah. you know, but, but I know what you're saying. But same with, uh, like, The Graduate. I had that experience where all my life I'd heard it was, like, this really gross movie about this older woman that sleeps with a younger guy. Mm-hmm. And then when I watched it, I was like, okay, if that's what you got, like, if that's the only thing you got out of the movie, you probably, A, didn't see it, or B, like, it's not, like, you don't get it. Yeah, and also just think about that movie, too. That movie, you know, 60s, right? Or the 70s, like, 69 or something? Yeah, I think so. But, like... Wait, which movie are you talking about? The the Graduate. Yeah, I think they were both around the same time, actually. But what's funny about that movie is uh, it was not not as much as a little bit after this time, but, like, when rock music became a thing, Yeah, uh, you couldn't it was like devil music. Right. So this movie, the graduate comes out and the fact that th- it was insinuated that like a 21 year old slept with a middle-aged woman is bad already. Yeah. And of yeah. course, when you watch the movie, you don't see anything. You just see basically right. them dressing after the scene. And that that's all you need is the, impl- like the insinuation of knowing what happened. Right. But it is like before you n- have all the, the notoriousness it's like, what am I getting myself into? Yeah, and you like strap down. This. And and to, br- to bring it all back around, your point is like, there's very few movies that actually live up to to when you grow up hearing that they're the, so bad. Yeah. And none of these wound up being those movies for you. Yeah. <laughs> so let's jump into this movie. So first of all, um, if you are just now joining us or if you forgot the last couple of weeks, this is not a traditional series. This is like a director's, um, basically like this is this is my stamp. This is um, my portfolio. My portfolio. Like here's some themes, but these characters are not the same. Um, none of that. And um, so a couple of things to just talk about about the series in general. It's called the Three Cornettos um, or the Three Flavors Cornetto trilogy. And the first movie is the Strawberry. Cornetto ice cream. The second movie is the blue, which is vanilla, vanilla, I think. And then the third movie is chocolate chip mint. And the reason behind that is, and I I will say, spoiler alert, I don't like to do that on this podcast because if you're listening to this, you know that we spoil stuff. But this movie is pretty has a pretty wild twist, and if you don't know about it, it, it is probably mine. I don't think I knew about the twist. And so it was like, oh, I mean, what's like, happening? Remember in this how movie? I described how I watched this movie the first time? Yeah. My no. mom just randomly selecting oh, it a blockbuster yeah. from my memory. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, what are we watching right now? <laughs> yeah. Um. So now I'm going to be talking about it. But because of the alien slash robot um, nature of the movie, uh, it kind of references back to like, the government and people calling aliens like the little green men, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so that is where that color ties into it. And then another cool cool thing about the series uh, that I wanted to touch on is that they all have these common themes, uh, individuals as a collective, growing up, and the dangers of perpetual adolescence. And I think the... Dangers of Perpetual Adolescence shines the brightest in all three movies. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, read it again. Individuals as a collective, growing up, and then dangers of perpetual adolescence. So those are like the themes that are throughout. Um, and then, yeah, so now, now we've talked about like the series. Now I'm going to zoom in on this movie. Um, it, it is the same crew as the other ones, directed by Edgar Wright, written by Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright. And then the music is by Stephen Price, who uh, did the music for Gravity, 
Baby Driver, Suicide Squad, and Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, cool. amongst others. Uh, the cinematography is Bill Pope, who is like an all-time great. Um, he did Scott Pilgrim. He did Baby Driver. He did what? The Matrix? All three movies? Okay. That's amazing. Uh, and then he did a little movie called Spider-Man 2, one of the best superhero movies ever made. So this guy... I feel like that's controversial. Uh, well, it shouldn't be. If you want to talk about it off air... I'm just representing the other side, even though I like it. Yeah, what are you, who, who are you defending? <laughs> I just think it's funny. Uh, the budget of this movie is $20 million. Uh, domestically, it makes $26 million. Worldwide, it makes $46 million. And so, now let's get into a couple of the production notes. Uh, Edgar wrote this when he was 21. Wow. Um, and it was a screenplay called Crawl, and it was about teenagers. It was, like, just the teenagers. Okay. So then later through life, he, like, sees the potential of a reflection on childhood and returning home. That's pretty cool that, the how like, what it became. Yeah. Like, like that he allowed it to change. Mm-hmm. And then, As he also changed. Yes. <laughs> and then he, the, uh, Simon Pegg said that they did not choose the genre of this first. They were writing the movie about um, the, the alienation from your hometown and coming back, and they said when you take it to its literal conclusion, this is what it becomes, a sci-fi movie. So that was not like they weren't, they didn't sit down and go, let's write a sci-fi movie with a twist in it. They were writing the movie and then they're like, this is where it needs to go. That's how it feels. It does. Yeah. Um, and then they worked on each pub having an element of symbolism or foreshadowing, um, each pub name. And I, why did they choose 12? Oh, I don't know. Cause I was in thinking about while we were watching the movie, I just kept thinking like, why 12? That is just so many. Mm-hmm. Not, I don't even think it's a critique of they need to, whittle it down no i'm just curious why so many yeah i don't know i wonder if there's yeah. if it's just like a real thing in yeah. some town well, it would, it would makes i mean 12 is a large enough number that it makes sense that they weren't able to do it when they were teenagers that's true yeah if it was like um you know like seven you'd be like come on really you couldn't do that i mean yeah not me <laughs> that would yeah. be hard for me but um 12 is like oh this would be crazy if they could do that um, then, uh, finally, Brad Allen was the stunt coordinator for this movie, and he's worked with, oh, I don't know, a little guy named Jackie Chan. Wow. So, uh, he did the stunts in this movie. Like, he coordinated the stunts and helped plan them, which makes sense as to why the stunts are, like, insane in this movie. So... Dang, that oh, is really cool. Another thing they commented on was that they they wanted to play on the idea of like when you get the drunker you get the more like you feel like you can take on the world kind oh, of a thing yeah. yeah so it's like they 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 purposely made it to like the drunker they get the better they are at fighting that was like a decision they made for the movie which is a fun touch yeah that is cool so uh, i just looked now. up like why are there 12 pubs uh-huh and this thing kind of talks about each one's significance Oh, please, please. I was actually going to look that up. Okay, so the first post, this one speaks... This is on Oracle of Film. Okay. So this one speaks for itself. It's the first bar on the list. Um, and then The Old Familiar, number two. As the gang enter the second bar, there's a joke about the Starbucks chain where every pub looks the same these days. The Famous Cock, three. Uh, we don't see much of this one as Gary King turns out to be barred due to his drunken behavior as a child. The Famous Cock, get it? Yeah. Um. The Crossed Hands, four. Uh, this is where things get a bit harder to read in terms of probably symbolism. Um, real definitions are easier to get from the actual pub sign where the hands are crossing each other. There is a sense of teamwork in the picture, and in a way, this is the first pub where the, your heroes actually learn to fight together. Oh, is that where the aliens come out? I am assuming. Okay. Yeah. Um, five, The Good Champions. Again, this one. Is, this is one of the pubs that doesn't get a lot of screen time. Um, the idea is that in order to avoid suspicions, the friends pretend they are enjoying the Golden Mile. And the that's the the picture of the sign. Oh, of uh, like theater masks. The trusty <laughs> that's, servants. That's pretty cool. Wow. Six. I wonder if there's twelve just because they thought of it. Yeah. Um. Six. The trusty servant. 
This is the bar where we learn a bit about the robots. Gary King interrogates his old drug dealer friend. Okay. Trusty. Servant. Oh, yeah. Okay. The two-headed dog, seven. This one is easy enough. Okay. The two-headed dog is referring to the battle with the twins. They fight and interact with Sam together. Okay. Eight, the mermaid. This pub is... Oh, this probably makes sense, actually. This pub is more of a club and where we meet the marmalade sandwich, the elusive two blondes and a redhead. But it's like mermaids, you know, seduce. Yeah. Um, oh, this movie got so much I know, better, right? That's so the, cool. I, mean, I would do 12 too if I could come up with all these <laughs> yeah. things. The beehive nine, which the sign of the beehive, the beehive reminded me of the park carpet from The Shining. Wait, can I get? Oh, cool. But beehive because like the hive mind of the aliens. Because isn't that when they yeah, attack them? Yeah, this is them? the pub where we discover the plot of the robots thanks to Mr. Shepard, Pierce Brosnan. The robots want everyone working together at the same level just like bees. Yep. Ten, cool. The King's Head. No one is overly sure. Okay. The only concrete theory that I found is the fact that this is where Gary King finally loses his head. He cracks and even with death at all angles, he is intent to finish the Golden Mile. Okay. The Hole in the Wall, 11. I mentioned it. Okay. Martin crashes a car through the wall of the bar and saves his friends creating a hole in the wall he also jumps out the window in that bar i think too yes then 12 the world's end um, the world's end <laughs> yeah this pub is where the world comes to an end the network is defeated whoa that's Shoot. so cool yeah um all these movies have such crazy this foreshadowing is why he's stuff the best this is why I, I was thinking oh no well i'll save it i'll save it no no, no, no just say it. okay so like watching this movie and we had already watched two of his other movies and I will continue to watch them until the end of time. And this is why <laughs> until the world's end until the world's end. Uh, the, the way that he, it's, it just comes down to his editing again, but I think it's also his script and his direction. Like when they go to a pub and the guy's pulling the beer into the steins or yeah. the, the pints, why would you not shoot it in an interesting way? Like he did it. Oh like yeah. Like if he just did it, nothing really creative or anything, it would just be another dramedy. It would be another yeah, comedy. Yeah. Why are people not thinking about doing things in a different way? Yeah. I don't get it. Or like the one scene when they're checking into the B and B. Yeah. Uh, it, the the way it's blocked is everyone in the group is in frame, uh -huh. but not but everyone it's all like st staggered. Like it is such a dynamic shot. Yeah. And if it was a less imaginative director there would be like a million cuts in that scene a million <laughs> yeah. but because he's blocked it so perfectly like he, everyone kind of gets a line in that scene more or less and uh -huh. they, he doesn't need to do a million shots and it's more interesting and i'm sure that there is some significance on how he blocks people based on maybe even the importance to gary king well and and i think there is a couple of things when you when you're talking about the blocking yeah i mean these are actors he's worked with all of them before yeah um, and so he knows what they can and can't do. Yeah. So that's helpful. He is also working with one of the greatest cinematographers who famously filmed three movies that have a lot of people in a lot of shots yeah. in the matrix. Like that guy knows how to block shots as well. Bill mm -hmm. Pope. So like you put those two things together. Um, and you were already commenting, like you, 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 you said the Spielberg thing last night um about oh, his blocking just, like micah said see last series we did yeah jurassic park steven we talked spielberg about is the master of blocking which is true mm -hmm. and i think edgar wright is an equal i said close second last night i'm saying equal today wow uh just because he he these movies are just they're you know base level they are comedies yeah and like a lot of people complain and how it's so misrepresented misrepresented in the academy is like sometimes I think it's because they just all feel the same to people. Yeah. And that's why a lot of people and parents might feel like they're bad. Like Ron. <laughs> yeah. Which, of course, a lot of them are. But that's part of why make, what makes them so funny sometimes. Yeah. But it's like, and in some ways, you know, you can't, not everything can be great because then it would be boring. So I'm not like arguing right. that people need to necessarily be better in some ways. But it is just like, a comedy, you know, ho uh, sorry, I'm going all over the place, but like horror is also never represented in yeah. awards until like finally Get Out happens. Finally, an interesting uh, horror movie that has something to say. And it's like comedy will probably still never be represented because it's always just like the ugly cousin. Well, there's, there's something about um, 
both both comedies and horror and and I think it it must have something to do with like your reaction to them because you have when you watch a good horror movie you have a physical response. Yeah. When you watch a good comedy movie you have a physical response. And I think that there is something in like uppity film circles that they want to like delegitimize like like you when you laugh at a joke you're not going or, or when you're scared, you're not going like, oh, I am laughing because of blank, 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 blank. So you're not analyzing it. It just happens to you. Yeah. And I think there maybe is something to like some like uppity film people are like, yeah, there's nothing to it. It's just a joke. When really know, the so genius cr- is yeah. they made you turn off your brain N- and not in the negative way. You no, say no, no, turn totally. off your brain. But they, they f- like in this movie, they made you laugh and you didn't know why. But when you watch it a second time, you can be like, oh, they set that up. That's why I was laughing. Or you can sit here and do an hour-long podcast about it, you know? Yeah, and it's just like, you know, a lot of comedy movies do have an element of drama a little bit to it because a character wants something or they need to change. So, like, that's just a story. Mm-hmm. But, like, what what makes Edgar Wright movies, like, so different is, like, he... It's just everything is so fleshed out. Everything is so conceptual, that like I I relate and feel a lot more in his movies than I would in like another movie. Like we watched yeah. Paul last night. Yeah, it's it was funny. That's about it for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it was like I've definitely seen worse movies than that movie. Yeah, but it, I just like because we've been watching it right. Just thinking of like, I mean, you could have shot this in so many different cool ways, but they didn't, and that's fine. I not actually, not everything I, yeah. works to uh, yeah. do it all in a super creative way, but. Like Paul, Paul was not. Which for the listener, um, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost wrote this movie, Paul, about an alien and these nerds that get yeah. the alien. Um, and I, I actually thought like that was a pretty darn good movie. And I, I really think the director nailed like getting that Spielberg feel without. And not to not to bash Super Eight. I'm not bashing Super Eight, but Super Eight is like a kind of a carbon copy Steven Spielberg. Oh yeah, no one's saying it's not. Yeah, yeah. And Paul was like, "Oh, this is not a Spielberg movie, but it's like winking at you." Yeah. And I I liked that element of it a lot. Yeah. And how they they literally got Steven Spielberg to cameo, <laughs> which is blew my mind. Yeah. But anyway, I think I've just what I what I'm a point I'm trying to make is like be because of how comedy is looked down upon. Yeah. I I just and. Not that you that everything needs to have an award or anything like that, right, right. but it's just, you know, that's the Super Bowl of movies. So it's, yeah. sometimes you, your brain goes there. It's just like, I just don't think he'll ever get an award, like an, an Oscar for making movies like this. And I know he's made other really great well, movies mean, too. And he, it's not he got it's nominated not, for Baby Driver, his script, that's I think. great. Or I mean, Baby Driver was nominated for several awards and I'd put it in the same category of like this type of movie. It is different. Yeah. But it is like funny. But you know what action. I'm trying to say? It's yes, just like yes. these are so good and they, they make me feel things more than like probably a lot of Oscar winners. Well, I don't know. Maybe like a Green Book. Yeah. And The English Patient, according to Elaine Bennis. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have uh, actors? Yeah. So I'll was... get off my high horse. <laughs> so Eddie Marson, who plays, I already forgot, Peter Page. Um, who is the guy that was bullied as a kid? Yeah, in the group, uh, he is in everything. That moment is kind of a wild moment when he sees him in the bar. But we'll wait oh. till we're in the plot. Yeah, that's all what I'm trying to say, but it's hard to express. Yeah, but this guy is in everything. He's yeah. in this movie. He's recently in Vice. He's even in White Boy Rick. But he's in some Fast and Furious stuff. He's in The Gentleman. <laughs> You said you said he's even in White Boy Rick like anyone saw that That's movie. That's a joke. Um, but he's in oh. God's Pocket. He's in Filth. Jack oh, the yeah. Giant Slayer. Oh, yeah, God's Pocket. <laughs> um, he's and just, he's a he's British guy. In I so, bet he's, he's in, in so much. He's in yeah. War Horse. I mean, the only thing he's probably not in is Harry Potter for some reason. Is he not in there? I'm not seeing it. But he's oh, in Sherlock man. Holmes. Tr- like, or the, the show Robert Sherlock. Downey Jr. one. Oh, okay. Um... He's so good. He's always such a treat when he's in a movie because he's so funny. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've covered a lot of the people who are in this movie. Pierce Brosnan, have we ever covered him? No. He's a James Bond. 
Look at two, him, guys. Two no, look at him. He's a James Bond. Two movies in a row with a James Bond in him. He's and a- they, they're both villains. <laughs> yes. He's also in Mamma Mia. And yeah. he's also in... Mamma Mia, here we go Mrs. again. This is Downfire. He is, he's also in a, um, The Foreigner with Jackie Chan, which you and I were like, ooh, this should be fun. And it was Maybe we don't so talk about it, boring. Because I think we're in a minority there. Yeah. It just well, my complaint and uh, is that uh, less less espionage, more Jackie Chan stunts. That's what I wanted. Same. That's what I wanted too. Yeah. Um, Roseman Pike. She is in what most people probably know her from, Gone Girl. She is the titular Gone Girl. <laughs> um, she's also in Pride and Prejudice. Jack Reacher. Whoa. Watership Down. Jack Reacher just jumped up even further in our to be watched. I know. Hostiles. Oh, yeah. She was good in that. Wasn't that movie pretty boring? Very, very boring. <laughs> she She's also in a lot. Okay. Um, it was a good movie, though. I think it would just maybe isn't my cup of tea. I remember of seeing the trailers and you and Preston being like, I think we should, like, let's see the movie, I think, because, yeah, you guys went and saw it, and I'm just like, yeah, pass on that Well, one. it was the guy who made uh, Out of the Furnace. Oh, yeah. Apparently um, it didn't work enough. The trailer was not enough yeah. for me. Out of the Furnace is... Amazing. That's a good movie. Yeah. I love that movie. And and Hostiles is good. I'm not bashing the movie. It, it, I just, I it was kind of like I was twiddling my thumbs a little bit. Mm-hmm. Sometimes sometimes a good movie is just boring for certain people. Well, I'm curious because I haven't seen it. But how I feel about Out of the Furnace, um, that movie is written in such an interesting way that it feels like the movie starts at the end, based on I the don't events. really remember. Okay, well I don't remember it point by point. Mm-hmm. But I remember by the time we got to the end of the movie, it's like oh this feels like the movie like because of a big thing that happened. Okay. And I'm curious if hostiles felt like it never started. Like, I wonder no. if that's a style. No, oh, it was just okay. slow. It was just very slow. I mean, that's pretty much it because most of the other people in this movie we've covered. Okay. Well then let's talk about the movie. So the movie already starts kind of with like it. Do, it's surprising that I wasn't, no, it's not surprising, but you would think I would have been primed for this movie the first time I saw it, because it begins with uh, a voiceover from Simon Pegg showing his younger self and all of his friends and talking about the good old days, mm-hmm. and he's kind of a rebel, and it's showing all this old footage that's like shot on old film and stuff like that, and then they talk about how the last day of school they try to do the Golden Mile, which is a pub crawl, a pub crawl on 12 pubs in their hometown. And then talks about, like, Ollie, like, lost it after four, and this one did this, and then they didn't finish it. Mm-hmm. And then, But it was the best night of their lives. Yeah, and then you see the camera pans out, and you see that he is in an AA meeting mm-hmm. talking about it. And he's like, and life was never as good again. And everyone's like, do you have anything to... Th- like, that you regret? I forgot the guy. One of the guys asked yeah. a specific question. I think that's what he asks, and he says that we uh, that I never finished. I think that was that's, his regret. Yeah, not that. so. It's like, ooh, is this your first AA meeting? Which I think it might actually be based on things oh, that we learned. But yeah, um, but but it's it's cool because it, it primes you for one like this. This is going to be fun, but that we're going to dive into some pretty deep stuff, and then it also just shows you like like right away his motivation. And, and, um, I forgot the other thing, but it, it, it really sets the table. Also, everyone's in a circle and the shots from above and he's mm-hmm. talking about the golden circle mm-hmm. and the golden circle. called a circle. Oh, golden mile is what they call it. Huh? The circle's still cool. <laughs> yeah. Dang it. I was, boy, I was reaching and That's I. That's so okay. So he sets out to reunite all the guys, which of course, like anyone, they have grown apart over the years and they're now mm-hmm. the, uh, 16 years ago. Yeah. So, um, he he goes to each guy. I think does he he starts with um, Peter. I don't remember the actor's name, and I we just covered him, but <laughs> at the car dealership and trying to get him to go. And what's interesting is each time he goes to someone to convince them to come, they say, "Is Andy coming?" Right. And he's always, he just says, "Yeah, of course. Why wouldn't he come?" So it's like, okay, baggage there. Um, when he keeps saying that he already agreed, like he he already talked to him. Yeah. Um. So the the biggest thing that you see here is that everyone has moved on. Like, everyone has grown up. Yeah. And a lot of them are pretty much confused, like, that Golden Mile thing? Really? Yeah. Like, we never even really cared that much at the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
but uh, he convinces them all to come. A big reason that is when you see he's with Andy convincing him to come, who was Nick Frost, telling him that his mom died. Yeah. So it's like, okay, I'm going to do this for him. And one one thing that's really nice, just on like a technical level, that's pretty fun, is in this movie, um, Nick Frost is like a put together person. He's a straight man. In the other two, yeah, in the other two Cornetto movies, he is not. It, he is unbelievable. Simon Pegg is unbelievable. They are believable. fantastic I was, actors. When we were watching this, I was just feeling so thankful that he is in one of the best action franchises of all time. And I'm talking Mission Impossible. Oh, baby. Mission Impossible. We got to get Tom Cruise on the pod. I'm watching this and I'm like, I cannot get enough of Simon Pegg. Yeah. He is just so good. And he is clearly so versatile. Well, and when when we were watching Paul, I was like, he, he was good enough, like... Him and Nick Frost. Him and Nick Frost, like the way their hair was done and everything mm-hmm. and the way they were acting, I wasn't thinking about any of their other roles, the whole movie. No. I'm just like, oh, they're just these two nerds. I just, uh, it's crazy. They do disappear into their roles. They really it's do. So good. It's awesome. Love it. So gets the guys back together. Is going to pick him up at a train station. You, you learn pretty quickly that he is not someone you can trust. He's not a reliable person. Um, And, you know, this this all the stuff in the movie you're learning about each guy mostly learning about gary king and i remember this is like the third time i've watched it so i'm just feeling like more uncomfortable than usual in this rewatch yeah. um and like when he comes to pick him up in his car uh they're talking about like oh remember that car that i sold you like 16 years ago and he's yeah. like yeah this is it and it's like everyone's oh, like weird really and then when they're in the car and he's like, let's listen to some music and they play this tape and, and yeah. they're like, oh my gosh, is this the, you like, like remember m- when I put this song on a tape for you? Yeah. And they're like, you, you did like, you made a tape for this. That's pretty cool. And he's like, what, what are you talking about? This is the, this yeah, is the this tape. is the tape. And he's like very oblivious to all of that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so uncomfortable. It's, it's also like, especially knowing that Edgar Wright originally was working on a script. I don't know if he actually completed it, but was working on a script when he was 21 called Crawl. And it was just about the teenagers. That makes sense. But um, if he had tried to make this movie, being a 21-year-old, it's just not going to happen. Because mm-hmm. there's such a like adult, um, have-to-have-experienced-life kind of thing. Absolutely. Otherwise, I think this movie... Like, this movie potentially could be like when you're reading a story or a book. Well, it could it could feel like how in Jurassic World we kept talking about how, like, Bryce Dallas Howard's character feels like men wrote a woman role. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't feel like there's any actual life in her character. Mm-hmm. And this movie could so easily be that, where you're like, nah, this is someone this is who the obligatory, hasn't drank beer or something. Yeah, like, like, this is the obligatory this guy. This is the obligatory this guy of the group. And this yeah, guy of the group. Yeah. But none of them feel like that for a second. No. And, it, like, I think it's just the writing is so good and the, the beginning intro part with all the teenagers, like him basically doing the voiceover thing, really establishes each person. Yeah. But then not only that, we're seeing them as adults. So it's even more like, oh, you're not that kid anymore. Yeah. But that's how Gary King defines all of them. <laughs> yeah. Is like by that one night. Right. Oh, and also the the soundtrack to this movie is really cool. Yeah. And it, it's a lot of I'm assuming like deep cuts from their childhood and stuff. I think yeah. I read something about that. And it's stuff as an American teenager that grew up in the 2000s and a little bit of the 90s. Music I've never heard. Like yeah. so it it's kind of refreshing to watch instead yeah. of like you know, if it was American, it might be like a bunch, you know, a bunch of songs that you've heard. It's nice to have like a palette change yeah. in the music department. Yeah. Um. So, let's see. They a police officer pulls him over and he asks him about the car. And Simon Pegg never registered the car under his own name these whole years. And like his friend has, who's in the backseat, has been like getting tickets and stuff mm-hmm. for years. For years. Again, so he, he doesn't have life put together to take responsibility of yeah. anything. Um, and then they do they go to the first pub then right about well then, they go or? to the bed and breakfast but then yeah they go to the first pub. Um, you see that it's been basically made into a chain. Yeah, and let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, they talk about how it's been starbucked or yeah. like Starbucksified or whatever they say, and so um, there there is definitely a lot there. In in you know all the all of these Cornetto movies have like a lot of other themes going on and just this idea of like 
towns kind of turning into like corporate kind of stuff yeah i do you feel that way oh i have have you been to medford <laughs> yeah i guess we we've, we've seen our our town go from you know the the small little town where just people a lot of people live but then it's like oh now we have an in and out burger now we have a chick-fil-a now we have two chipotles two <laughs> mod pizzas and we're getting another five guys like uh, yeah so th- it's just for this they're all commenting on how it's just becoming like everything else yeah um, the, char- the charm is gone the and charm like, is gone these from what i understand like english pubs are like very you go into one and it's like a very charming experience so to go into one and it feels starbucksy mm-hmm. must be kind of a nightmare <laughs> yeah um and andy who is nick frost does not drink so he orders water which really shocks gary because it's like i told you i don't drink and it's like yeah but we're doing this thing yeah so just like shut up and drink um and as the the, in the first couple pubs they kind of all they have some conversations about things um kind of like trying to catch up a little bit but gary won't engage in these like catching up conversations um, but you do learn a little bit more about each guy. Some of them are married. Some of them have been divorced. Just like they've lived life in, in several ways. Like a lot of them like own their own business or like Andy, he's like the corporate guy now. Yeah. Um, it's, it's wild how well defined the characters are and yeah. how easy it is to like track everything in this movie. Yeah. It, it, it's pretty, it's very impressive writing. <laughs> it really is. So in the next pub, uh, it's basically the same pub because it's also been Starbucked. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's when uh, Rosamund Pike comes in onto the scene, I believe. Yeah. Um, and it's Martin Freeman's wife. Yeah. Or we didn't even sister, mention not wife, Martin sister. Freeman. Well, we've covered him in the Hobbit. Well, uh, no, I know. It's just wild that we've gotten this far and we haven't talked about Martin Freeman. Oh yeah. Martin Freeman's in this movie. He's amazing in this. Yeah. Just like everyone else. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Rosamund Pike is in town as well. And Gary just assumes because 16 years ago they had sex in a disabled bathroom that that's just she goes to the bathroom and he assumes that that's her yeah. let's go have sex in the bathroom which of course she is appalled slaps him leave suddenly and you find out that what's the other guy's name steven steven yeah uh, he, he is they establish in the beginning montage that gary always swooped in on girls that steven liked yeah. Before Steven could. Um, so the, Rosamund Pike is a, another one of those girls. And he, you can tell he's never quite gotten over her. But Gary doesn't even give him a chance. Yeah. Um, so then they go to the next pub. Mm-hmm. For a pub three now. And this is where we see the bully. Yes. You, um, you can talk about it. So this one guy. That- oh, wait, wait, wait. I think, yeah, we find out at the second pub, though, that his mom is calling. Uh, Gary King's mom's calling, yeah. so she's therefore she's not dead. Yeah. So the third pub is them confronting him about yeah. it. Okay, continue. And then and then during during this scene, there there's a point where this man walks up to um uh, the character Ollie, and he's like, "Hey, can I borrow your chair?" And he kind of freezes up and looks at him. And then when he leaves, he says, "He," they're like, "Oh, are you okay? That was your high school bully." And he's like, he 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 makes this point that he didn't. It, it's not it's not I, I it's not that he didn't oh it's not that he beat him up all those times and like all these terrible ways i it, mean it's like that he didn't recognize me just yeah. now so what was it all for yeah which and is like, like an expl- oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like very explosive and uh in my brain you know where it's like that is such an insane point to make yeah now as we as we find out later all these people that they're seeing are in fact robots mm-hmm. or aliens or they, they're never like a hundred percent clear on what that is uh, um yeah we'll touch well, on no, it. actually they are it's just like i don't know that we necessarily have a word for it well they are they did come from outer space you know what's funny though what they spend a lot of time trying to decide what to call them and they wind up calling them the blanks because they can't think of a good word. Well, and I just went through they, that exact thing. They keep calling them robots, but then they, those guys keep saying like, but do you, the word, do you know what the word robot means? What it implies? <laughs> yeah. It implies slaves. And we're not slaves to these things. Like, Well, and here's what's wild. So, yes, what you just said. Uh, in a later scene, actually, I think in this scene, Gary claims that he's he is free and they're all slaves. They're all slaves to their jobs, yeah. to their family, 
when in fact we know that he, like the robots, is a slave to his um, addictions and his past, mm-hmm. and they're the ones that are actually free. Mm-hmm. So I didn't put that together until just now, but he is like... Like, the town is, like, the literal manifestation of his slavery that's in his head, his own Mm -hmm. head, that he has to, by the end of the movie, overcome to actually be free. Yeah. That is pretty freaking cool. Yep. It's a good movie. So they try confronting him about his mom, and then, you know, he pretty much, without without missing a beat, is like, oh, I haven't talked to my mom in eight months. (laughs) So then it's also, like, another notch there. It's just, like, what is this guy's deal? Yeah. And it's just so sad. And like then his he, problems. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay. Are you done? Yeah. Okay. Because then uh, Mr. Simon Pegg slash Gary, he needs to go to the bathroom. I'm, I'm teeing you up. Oh, so he goes to the bathroom and a kid comes in. Oh, this scene was so uncomfortable too. He's trying to talk to this teenager just like, yeah, I put that hole in that wall right there. That was a crazy night. You were doing the gold mile and I ever heard of it. I mean, if you, if you want to like tag along be like totally cool like the kids just saying nothing yeah it's It's so so uncomfortable uncomfortable. um and then of course you find out that the kid is one of the robot alien things um and did you find out why they're blue oh no i forgot to look that Um, up i just don't get why they wouldn't be green but because of the color for the yeah for the cornetto but whatever um so finds out that this is the big huge twist of like what the f is going on yeah so he gets in a fight with them. The other guys show up. Even more kids show up. Big fight scene. Well, and and they, when he gets into the fight, he doesn't know what's going on. But then the kid gets thrown into a urinal, and his head like explodes. That's right. And there's blue paint everywhere. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. And then the other guys come in, and then the other robots come in, and they have this big fight, and it's choreographed. It's a fake oneer. A lot of it is like there's not a whole lot mm-hmm. of uh, different takes. Um, which th- because of how this is done, I loved how they shot this scene. I mm-hmm. think it's really cool. Um, and, and it's very creative how they're fighting them. Yeah. I, I, uh, because they, they don't know like martial arts or anything like that, but they're like ripping off their arms and, you know, blue stuff is coming out and then hitting them on the head with their arms. Yeah. Or yeah. A lot of, it's a very cool sequence. How they like, w- how they decided to on the like material because like the when they smash a head or something it looks like barbie plastic to me yeah or like well it feels like a like a vase to me yeah because it's like they're jagged and broken and they shatter i'm just curious why like what what led them to choose that yeah material looking just for fun so yes they have this fight and then they basically go out of the bar they put up an out of order sign that was established earlier in the Mm -hmm. movie and they sit down And they're like, what the heck are we going to do? We got to get out of town. And then Gary says, we should just keep doing what we're doing because the town knows that we're doing this. And if we don't do this, they're going to know it's suspicious and try and stop us. And we're drunk and we can't like drive our cars and stuff like that. And as they're doing that, the acting is so good throughout the movie with them getting more drunk and drunk. Oh, yeah. It is like so funny. (laughs) And I wonder if like... Uh, you already talked about the idea of writing this movie and how they wrote it and everything. But I think, yeah. I wonder if at some point it's like, I mean, this is just a natural progression, but they're like, what would it be like if there was like an, an alien invasion and these guys are drunk? <laughs> yeah. What would it be like? And this is that movie. Yeah. <laughs> but then, then they decide, you, you know, or they're, they're deciding. And then the, the camera shows you that Andy is drinking all five shots that were ordered. Mm-hmm. The guy who was not drinking, and he's like, "We're gonna finish this." Yeah, and so they're like, "Okay." So uh, then, let's see. When people drink, they have those big com. Oh yes, I did want to point this out. Again, another cool writing thing. When people classically get drunk or high, a lot of times what's brought up is like the meaning of life, and uh, depending on who's around or whatnot, you'll talk about like God and your family and all that stuff. And I, th- another fun thing about this movie is it is a literal, like, the drunker they get, the closer they are to discovering, like, the meaning of life. That's funny. So I'm sure that that was something that they yeah. included. So um, then they go to the next bar, and this is when Roseman Pike shows back up. Yeah. You. You. 
Um, so at this bar, they're continuing to figure out what to do. This might be the bar where they run into his friend, or that might be the last bar. I can't remember. Basically, yeah. they run into the guy that used to sell him weed when they were kids, and he's trying to be like, "What do you know? What's going on?" And he ba- he does know, and is like basically act cool and get out. Yeah. But also, I'm happy. I'm fine. Yeah. Um, and then uh, he t- says too much, and he gets called in mm-hmm. by the robots. Um, and those other two guys who were there who were like trying to get him to stop talking about it are really funny. Yeah. And like at the end of the movie, like how many people here are still themselves here? Another guy. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> One more guy. And then it's like three people. <laughs> really funny. Um, so yeah. So when Rosamund Pike shows back up they're they're f- the guys are furthering, trying to figure out like what is going on? What do they do about it? Um, they're trying to figure out what, what these things are, what to yeah. call them. And that's when the whole conversation about blanks, um, yeah. and this is when, you know, Steven getting drunker, having more courage to confess his feelings to Sam Roseman Pike. Yeah. Um, which ensues Gary gets there first again and it fights the twins. So another, another action sequence again, pretty funny cause the, he rips off one of like their arms of on one and of them. legs and legs and then the legs become the arms and it's just like it's really very disturbing actually it's really disturbing but also like kind of cool <laughs> interesting um so then rosamond's with them for most of the rest of the time because yeah. it's like what the heck is going on um and then i think that's when they go to the mermaid next yes so this is a club and it is funny that it's like all kids in school uniforms yeah. Like this is where kids go to like dance. So it's like a rave. Right. Which is where the marmalade sandwich is, which is the two blondes and one redhead. And they look like they have not aged in the last 16 years because they're not them. They're robots. Um, and like we already said, you know, like they're seducing them to try to get them to stay here. Um, is it there like a funny dance in this scene too? Don't they kind of dance like dance in it? I, no, no, no. That's just me writing. No, no. Disregard what I said. Okay. Um, and meanwhile, Steven has been grabbed by the janitor from Harry Potter. Yeah. And that guy is free, but he's, he's like on the down low. He's always been the nut who believed in UFOs. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, he's like, I'm right. I've, I've been <laughs> yeah. right. And he talks about how they, they will take your DNA uh-huh. and then they can, they, if, if you are not complying with them, they can just replicate you so yeah. that no one will be the wiser. And what's so funny about this is like it's cutting to the three other guys like grinding with these girls and like kissing them and getting these their... these girls who are not different from sixteen years ago. Yeah, yeah, and and he's he's saying like they could get your sweat or they could get your saliva from a kiss, and he pulls out this squiggly straw and is like, "Why do you think I drink out of this? Out of this funny straw?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And but meanwhile, you know, it's like oh, now they just have the the coding information for these people now yes um so they get out of this place and they go to the next bar and this is where pierce brosnan shows up so pierce yeah. brosnan was the cool professor or uh-huh. do they yeah yeah that, cool, no, the cool teacher say, yeah. back then um he, he was like the hard ass but he was like but what do you like really want to do with your life dude he <laughs> reminds me of the kyle mooney character in the comedy bang bang yeah. um but so he's there and he's pretty much convincing them of what's going on Mm-hmm. trying to and then you see that martin freeman is like not martin freeman anymore and that oh, that's is that what, when this is revealed I, I, this is when like a huge fight breaks out and i believe this is i believe it's this scene this this pub or the next one i think it's this one because because th- uh, th- throughout the I movie mentioned his there's, a, there's a weird switch yeah where like martin freeman is just like so into what's happening and well, he's no, like remember he goes to the bathroom by himself and he's in there for yeah. a long time and then yeah. there's a quick cut of him coming out and he, yeah, it's just, right, yeah. right. But if you forget, you miss it because oh, I, yeah. I forgot. I don't think it's he... like a ugh, kind of twist. No, like they showed oh, you. No, 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 no. But it, it, I, I think it's cool because from then on, he's like, "Come on, guys, let's go." Yeah, yeah this is fun. Yeah, and I, that's just really good. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then, then there's a big fight that ensues, and this is one of the coolest choreographed sequences in yeah. the movie. Um, I, and it's like. Anyone knows who's listened to this podcast. It's really hard to talk about these scenes 
without going into the minutia of it. Mm -hmm. But I think the most interesting part about the scene is throughout all of the fighting, um, Gary's still trying to drink. Yeah. And that to me is okay. So it's this town who that is now like everyone's a robot and he's living in the past and all of his friends are basically fighting the past because it's trying to suck them back in to this bubble. Yeah. And Gary is just trying to continue to enjoy the pub crawl, which shows he is not trying to fight his past. He is just like, whatever. Yeah. But because of the fight that's going on, he is continually like thwarted from drinking the beer. So he is forced to confront his town. Like he is forced Dang. to confront his past. Good, that's like his big Whoa. story metaphor arc thing. Yeah. So they continue the fight at, at some point, uh, Simon Pegg sends Sam away in his car, um, and then and then basically like Martin Freeman, half his head's been knocked off his head, mm-hmm. and then they gather in one of the other pubs, mm-hmm. and it's what is there three left now or four something like that, and um, they they show each other scars because oh they meet in the in a golf house on a they're not in a pub they're, oh, they're like not? in they're like in a golf shed on a golf course oh. Because cause in this scene, when everything is really chaotic, Gary says, I forget, th- whatever the word is, is probably what they always called this golf shed. Oh, so they okay. knew all to meet up here. Oh. So they, they meet up here, and then, like you said, they're arguing about, like, how do I know it's really you? They show all these scars. Um, they're trying to get Gary to show a scar that's, like, on his arm or something, but he won't take off his jacket. Yeah. Um prove it in other ways but it's like later on it's like oh, okay that makes sense why he wouldn't take off his jacket um wait why de- doesn't he because of his wrists what's his what's his wrist he cut his wrist when you don't remember that no then we'll save it for oh later. okay but um pretty much they you know gary is still arguing to continue yeah so they, they well, get- th- this is also actually before we gloss over it though this is the scene where andy yes. explains because because Gary says, show me a scar to prove you're human. There's that one time when, you know, I, like, accidentally stabbed your finger. And he's like, how about the scar on my chest from the, or I, I, oh, think, no, I think it's no, no. his chest. It was a femoral artery. Femoral artery. Because basically he explains that him and Gary were driving and Gary crashed his car. No, Gary was ODing. Gary was and ODing. And Andy was rushing him to the hospital. That's right. And he crashed his car. And was basically bleeding out because of his femoral artery. Artery was severed. Yeah, and I think um, he was drunk too, because he, oh, okay. he gets. I think I thought he it was implied he got arrested and stuff. I don't remember that part. Ma- but no, I I, think I thought wrong, it was him but. like helping his friend, um, and basically like that. That is the straw that broke the camel camel's back for them. Mm-hmm. Um, not just because of that one thing that happened, but I think he said like, you let me down. I he might've said this later. He does say this a little bit later too, but it's like, he's like, you're Gary King. You're supposed to be the best. Yeah. And you like disappointed me. Yeah. Basically. Oh, it, you know, well, no, I think they already, no, never mind. Never mind. I'll, we'll get to that later. <laughs> oh, okay. So yeah. So they're racing through the woods. Um, Ollie, um, gets confronted by the bully again. Um, and you think it's like, oh, he's over. Yeah. But then you see him killing the the bully guy, and it's like an act of aggression of like, oh, I hate you. Yeah. Like, oh, I think he needed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but he he gets captured by the aliens. So Stephen, Andy, and Gary continue on. Um, they go, they do go to the next pub. They make it. This this is a lot of chasing scenes mm-hmm. at this time. Um, but you see that like Gary is still just desperate to finish because that's all yeah. he has left um and andy has that great line where he says how can you tell you're drunk when you're never sober yes pretty wild yeah um so steven well i guess we can just get to the last one so yeah that's the just, last yeah. one it's just gary and andy uh steven's not there really I'm pretty sure because they make the whole point no, about it being the three musketeers. You know, he That's drives his car into time. that pub, not the last pub, but the pub before it uh-huh. to try and get them to come with him. And Gary, that's when Gary jumps out the window and Andy follows him and all the aliens get to Andy. 
So it's like, oh, he's probably compromised. And then once they get to the last pub, Andy and Gary have another blowout conversation. Uh And that's when they get taken down. And um, Stephen is like brought to them. Or oh, he, but he, he shows up, but he's fine. He's yeah, fine. but he's he goes down. He has the big confrontation with everybody. Not Stephen. I think huh. it's just Andy and Gary. Because I could have sworn th- because that's when um, Andy and Gary are arguing, and that's when you find out Andy gets Gary's jacket off of him, and you see that his wrists are are have gauze around them, and he is wearing a hospital bracelet. Oh, I only noticed the hospital bracelet. No, yeah, his wrists were also like gauzed. So Wait, he so tried you were killing not, himself. I thought you were talking about the la- like the scene with the with the alien. No, I'm talking thing. about the last pub. That makes sense. Before they go down. That makes sense. So you find out that he tried killing himself. So if anything Wow, I totally didn't put that together. That's Can you believe that? Funny. Uh yeah, it's 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 like the big reveal of not only is this guy clinging to his past. <laughs> I feel it so is stupid like right his, now. No, no, it's fine. It's his like literal, I'm sure that you know, it's a sad thing to think about but because this guy is so broken that after this evening, if it had just been a normal evening, might have been his last evening. Yeah. You know, based on his erratic, depressive behavior. Yeah. So, yeah, they go down underground and you can take over. Well, and so this is when, like, the network, these alien species or whatever, uh, talk to them and, and you know, explain everything um, for all the people who are you know, plot centric, you get a lot of questions answered here about like the fundamentals of how Mm -hmm. the aliens work and stuff. And they give them a a choice and they say, Gary, which they, they point out, which is like a play on his name. He's Gary King of the humans. Yeah. And so he's like the representative of humanity. Yeah. And they do this thing where they say, you can be young again. And Gary like kills his younger self and says, which is the big, there's only one, Gary King. Yeah. Which is funny because I think either right before or right after that, he's like, there are so many other people like me, which yeah. is also like a big thing for him to admit. Cause I yeah. think Andy's like, whoa. And he's like, yeah, I know that. Yeah. So just, this is his big character development. And in, in, in this scene, um, you have not taken it this way, but I've uh, both times I saw it, it just, it does feel to me like a very like God, you know, saying like you need to believe. And I totally see it, but for some reason, it's just like the first time I saw it. I don't think I felt that way. Yeah, that's totally how the ending feels to me. Where it's like a like God saying you need to believe, and it's like you're mindless if you believe in Him. Yeah, it felt kind of like the statement, which could be part of why I didn't like the movie too much the first time because yeah. I don't agree with that. Yeah, outlook on God. Um, but. Uh, I think there's too much other stuff that even if that is the point that they're trying to make, like they're also making other points. True. And it it also like if if you take just the adolescent um, to its conclusion, like we're talking about it. I mean, there there isn't a lot of God stuff in the rest of the movie. So no. why would you just throw it in at the end? So I don't know. This is a seems this is the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy moment. Yeah. Cuz they're talking to this thing that basically is the position of authority whatever but the what makes it that moment this and for until the end of the movie it's so funny so they're having this big debate he's trying to convince them they're just still like no that's not right and then it ends with like do you really like want to take the chance of you guys being in control the humans really and they're like yeah and he's like okay fine he like <laughs> yeah. basically says it yeah, just like yeah. that and they're, and they're like really he's like yeah i don't care anymore like that yeah. was like such a hitchhiker's thing. So, um, yeah, the they go away. The, the robot alien thing, they all like basically dismantle themselves. Yeah. But it, because they've been, you know, they're around the world, it sets this huge surge around the world. Right. And then this this is like the what do you think about the this last section where where it sums up what's going on and Andy's talking and it's explaining where well, I think it's at. a nice sandwich because the beginning of the movie was voiceover. Nice. Um, and it's like, he's also kind of sitting, he's in sitting with in a circle with people telling a story. Um, so it, thematically like it, it's a sandwiching of the story. Yeah. Of course though, you're watching this movie and robot, robot alien things show up out of nowhere. That's shocking. You want something more shocking? Yeah. An apocalypse. Yeah. So it is like, now that I've seen it three times, it's just that 
like i know but i think maybe the first time i saw it i was a little like that's a little too much for me yeah i i think there there is a weird air about it that i can't quite put my finger on um but thinking it in terms of this time around like oh this is such a hitchhiker's thing yeah i think i liked it more yeah and i i could see i could see maybe me liking the ending a little bit better if say like they were on a hill and the world was exploding and they had like a last conversation yeah instead of like the world ended and no one knew da, da, you know but i'm not saying it's bad it in just any shows way. you like because like the last shot is gary with a few robots yeah um and so it's like he's he's still hanging out with teenagers yeah. In a lot of ways, like he's still kind of associating himself with that, with like younger people, but he is still like, he is like the leader again. Like it's kind oh, of like he's yeah. where he should be. See, I don't read that like that though. And, well, yeah. I mean, this, you know, this is like five minutes and especially yeah. his moment at the end, the last scene is like seconds long. But to me, it is a lot of like Shaun of the Dead where this man needed the zombie apocalypse to happen to know his true potential. Yeah. And I feel like, like this character needed an apocalypse to happen to, to live life to the fullest. Yeah. But I think, uh, like, uh, like reading them as teens, you know, I, I don't, I don't remember what they looked like, but I kind of read it at, at more of like, he's actually caring for other things because, yeah the aliens that are left on earth are are outcasts now yeah and like they're hated um they're like mutants and x-men or something so um i kind of read that as like he found like other outcasts and they're gonna yeah. help each other that's probably definitely the way to look at it yeah but um yeah we did it and he orders a water at the end yeah yeah wow crazy movie i mean a wild wild movie interesting to talk about mm-hmm I think it's really good. Mm -hmm. um, the each movie there, it goes from best to last. Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, this movie. Uh, wait. My favorite to least favorite. Okay, but they're all really good. So I was surprised because I thought the same thing going into this that Shaun of the Dead was the best, Hot Fuzz was second best, and at The World's End was my least favorite. But that is not what I wound up at. I wound up at Shaun of the Dead is the best. Number two, The World's End. Number three, Hot Fuzz. Wow. I really like Hot Fuzz, but that last just like half hour kind of wears me out, and mm -hmm. it, it kind of overstays its welcome a little bit for me. Yeah. It's by no means a bad movie, though. Yeah. Um, They're all kind of like equally great, too. So. Yeah, and it's just fun that each of them have like a... have relationships at the heart of them. Yes. And are not... It's not really a zombie movie. I mean, it is, but it's about... It happens to take place during a zombie apocalypse. And that, that's how they all feel. Yeah. Um, I think this series is really cool. You too. It's, it was interesting. It was fun to cover on the podcast because we've never covered a series like this before. Um, should we announce the next one? Sure. Do you remember what it is? You go for it. Are you sure? I mean, it was kind of your choice. Okay, the next series is Ip Man. Ip Man. Is it called the Ip Man series? Yeah. I mean, it's, it is it is a classic series in the way that it's like Ip Man 1, Ip Man 2, 3, 4. I might have seen the first one. Yeah. But I don't remember. I've seen the first one, and then I watched the second one way too late. It had a, when someone came over to spend the night when I was in high school, and uh, or maybe college, doesn't matter. I was never in college, but college years, uh, and <laughs> and I fell asleep. So I am like I don't know this series, but I'm really excited to talk about it. And I think I can say because I doubled in the dates, right? Sure. That, folks, you're gonna want to listen to next at at, at the very least, Ip Man One and Ip Man Two. But the whole thing, come on, don't shortchange it. No, I know, but in Ip Man One, we have. The stunt double from The Amazing Spider-Man, who was in the Spider-Man costume and helped pioneer how Spider-Man would swing. I think this is how you pronounce his name. I hope I get it right. Ilram Choi is going to be on the episode. 
And then I won't say who's on Ip Man 2 yet. Okay. But uh, yeah, it's going to be so cool. I mean, yeah. th- th- part of why we wanted to do this podcast was like, maybe we could meet some cool people and talk about movies. Mm-hmm. And we've had a nice run here. And now we're meeting someone who is actually like in the movie business. Yeah. Well, in the stunt business. Yeah. So, and it'll be cool because I think a lot of the, the series would be lost on us uh, because we're not martial artists. So um, tune in next Friday. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to go to patreon.com slash Micah McCaw and um, get your MPU, the sequel episode. It is either Incredibles 1 or Incredibles 2. I don't know what day this is coming out. And make sure to read recountandreveal.com. And also, watch my Little Women video where I transposed all the songs on guitar. Let's make it viral by the time this episode is one hour old. Bye. Bye.